and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Junkyard Digs. My name is Kevin Brown, and this is my faithful companion, Captain Poops a Lot. Just kidding, this is Coda. And this is a 1974 F350 Dually 4 barrel 460 4 speed Ranger XLT beast of a work truck. And we're going to see if it'll run and drive once again. So let's get to it. Now you may notice there's also another truck over there. That there is a 68 F100 that I'll be doing in a separate video. You can check that out right up here if I remember to put it in. If I don't, head to the channel and check it out there. And while you're there, make sure you hit subscribe. Currently there's only 39% of our viewers that are subscribed. So if you're one of that 61%, head down there and turn that red button gray so we can make even more great content for you guys. Without further ado, let's take a look at what we're dealing with today. All right, now that our intro is done, it is time to change shirts and tell you exactly where I am and why these are significant. That right there is a 68 F100, like I mentioned, from Oklahoma. And this right here is a 74 F350 from Oklahoma. My buddy Jed had taken a trip down south with an empty trailer, traded a couple trucks and brought these back, and eventually convinced me that I should own more problems. So here I am. If you recognize where I am right now, this is where we did the Thunderbird revival. The Honda ATC revival and ride with Derek. And where we pulled that rotary snowmobile from. That right there is a 303cc rotary. So it should go without saying that Jed has been a huge help to us making content in the past. And it should go without saying that if you guys need diesel work done, that's the place to go. Without further ado, I'm going to put this thing down so it stops biting me and get to work. All right, Cody, you want to tell them what we're dealing with here today? So this is pretty much just your typical 70s one ton with a few key features that make it really neat. Like this, the smack hit brush bar. <laughs> nice, thick, solid bar brush bar all the way around. Moving back, we have a sweet 70s spotlight right here. Seems to still be in functional condition, hopefully. Uh, and right below that, unit five is peeking through the paint. So I got to wonder, is this a fire truck? at one point with uh, it was probably being a one ton it was just a cab and it might have had a firebox on the back and some farmer probably got it and turned it into this up top we have some sweet clearance lights i really hope those work those are badass coming past our tow mirrors here really faintly in the paint right there the word smoky on the driver's door so i have my suspicions that this might have been a fire rig turned farm truck a little beyond that we've got a split window in the rear and then this sweet toolbox tank. This thing is built to withstand a nuclear bomb. Um, looks like we have no tank connections, so we'll have to figure all that out. And then of course, if you're down south working on the cattle ranch, what are you gonna have on your truck besides a flatbed? And this thing's a really nice one. It's gusseted and welded up and full plated, and it's got this bumper bar all the way around the um, strap hooks. Looks like JH manufacturing, maybe cutouts for the lights big old bumper hitch right there we got our duels and probably a ten and a quarter rear axle nice beefy headache rack up here interesting I haven't seen this before usually you have like half skirts that come to here and then your Rangers and higher models will come to here but this has a leather pouch and pockets on the bottom they go all the way down to here moving inside we have this beautiful seat cover over a seat that's if I had to guess Probably in really good shape. Oh wow, you know, that's really ugly actually. Is that supposed to be green or brown? A lot of mold on the steering wheel. The dash has got a few cracks in it. Our Ranger XLT badge. A couple kick-ass switches over there, probably for our running lights and some other surprise I don't know about. Big old leather headliner and whatever the hell this thing is. Oh wait, I know exactly what this is. This is your old Stetson holder right there. That holds your cowboy hat. <laughs> Oh my god, this truck is so southern. Ah, oh, check that out. It's like a factory Ford cargo light switch. That's badass. I've never even seen that before. Most importantly though, this right here. Big old four-speed transmission. Mm, boy. It's 
some kind of hood ornament that probably was really cool that is now missing. Dang it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, that's what I like to see. A giant crow. What the f <laughs> what is this? Oh, that's probably the hood ornament. Put that back on. In here, we have a four barrel Holly sitting atop 460 cubic inches of hell yes. Wait a minute, no it's not. I was told it is, but it's not, that's an FE. So you can tell it is by the way it is. So to identify an FE versus a 460, uh, or just in general identifying an FE, it's very simple and it's all about this seam right here. In FE, the push rods go through the intake so the intake extends underneath the valve cover and then meets way down here. And the heads are like some kind of like three quarter length head. It looks really weird. So if you see that seam right there, that means you have an FE. If I had a guess, this is probably a 390. All right, sitting here in post, I feel like I could have explained that a little bit better. So let me draw a couple diagrams to show you what I'm talking about with that seam. All right, this is a Ford FE engine. Here's the intake, here are the heads, and this is where they meet. Notice how that seam is under the valve covers. Since that intake has the push rods going through, as you can see, it proceeds underneath the valve cover, and part of the valve cover gasket actually seals to the intake instead of just the cylinder head. For comparison, here's a more regular motor. This is a 327 Rambler V8. Notice how that seam, the red line, is external of the valve covers and do not go beneath it. This is regular for most engines, which is what makes identifying the FE so easy. For the fun of it, here's a picture of a Buick nail head. These things are wild. In fact, if you notice, the valve train actually crosses its own path. I have one of these I'll build someday if I ever get the parts or the heads back. It's been almost three years. Anywho, back to the truck. So I bought this truck knowing that there was an issue with the fuel system and now I know what it is. It's not hooked up. Should be a pretty easy fix. Uh, this would honestly probably be drop a battery in, hit the key, drive home. However, there's not a lot of entertainment in that and definitely no educational benefit for our viewers. So, I'm gonna go through this as if it was a truck sitting out in the woods and show you guys everything you need to do to do your own revival on this era of Ford. And honestly, cars in general. For the most part, every single car you ever touch ever is different. They all have their unique reason they were parked. They all have unique problems, unique systems and schematics. Nothing is the same, but Everything's the same because a carburetor is a carburetor, an ignition system is an ignition system, valves are valves, and an engine is an engine. So if you understand the basics of each system and its components, you can make anything run. So starting out, I'm walking up to a truck I know nothing about. Two things I'm gonna do before I even touch a battery to bring it near the truck. Thing number one, get this air cleaner off and make sure there's nothing living in that carburetor. I don't want to suck a bunch of shit down into that car. Oh. <coughs> you appear to be clean. Checking for mud dauber nest, my shit, sticks, leaves, anything that might have happened. Because who knows, maybe this sat for five years before someone put an air cleaner on top of it. Step number next, does it have liquids? I do this every time, I don't always show it on camera. Sometimes it gets cut out, we forget to film it, blah, blah, blah. But we're pulling the dipstick to check the oil. And it is obnoxiously thick and needs changed really bad. All right, let's go for coolant. I heard pressure pop when I opened the lid, so I know the system's at least to one PSI. It's sealed. Chances are it's probably okay. I see some antifreeze in there. I definitely need to add some water before we drive. Transmission. Oh wait, that's right, it's a manual. Never mind. Before we usually do any actual long road trips with vehicles we revive, I'll always crawl underneath and check the transmission level and the differential level. It takes 10 minutes to check both of those. Costs you $4 in liquid to fill them because they're usually pretty much full. But it will save you having to replace a trans or a rear axle if they're empty. This one I did see has a bunch of grease packed up inside one of the wheels over there. So the O-ring on the end of the floating axle probably leaks and needs replaced. So I should probably check that fluid level before I even leave here. All right, next step. Take your hand, open the carburetor all the way and then close it all the way. Do that a couple times. Make sure nothing's binding and nothing's going to catch and hold your throttle stuck wide open in some weird scenario. A lot of times random springs and random spots will get bound, a wire will hang in the way. It's happened to me more times than I want to admit that I fire something up, hit the gas and just goes whoop and you gotta shut her down because 
your springs or something are goofy. Don't trust work other people did before you got it. Go through everything yourself so you know what you're about to ride or drive is properly correct. It's like why I never take any cars to other shops to be worked on, because I want to work on them myself. I do all my own work so I know what's wrong. I know it was installed incorrectly or slapped together with RTV. That was me. Next up, we're just gonna look for battery cables, make sure they're properly bolted on, not to fall off and spark into anything, cause a fire. I got a positive, I got a negative. Just checking the radiator hoses, make sure everything's present. Just give it a good once over. All our wires are here, nothing's chewed off. It's looking good. Once all your visual checks are clear and everything looks good, go ahead and throw a hand on that fan. Realize it's a clutch fan and that's not gonna work. And then go in your toolbox and grab a 15 16th if it's a Ford or who freaking knows what's gonna be today if it's a Chevy and put a ratchet down there on that crank, wait for the motorcycle to drive by and then turn that over. Do a couple rotations just to feel that the engine is good. If it's sticky, pull the plugs, dump ATF down the cylinders, let it sit and just roll it over Keep refilling them, PB Blaster, ATF, whatever you want, until you get that thing to roll over smooth. It's it's a crucial point for longevity of a motor, is to make sure you're not running dry rings up and down. I've been told this truck runs. I know it's ran within the last two years, I think. God knows last time it actually ran and drove as like a vehicle versus just a motor sitting here running, but I'm not too worried about doing a dry start on this motor. At this point, it's all up to you what you want to do next. You can pop that carburetor off and start doing carburetor things, which I know I'm going to have to do before I can really drive this today, because despite it probably working, the accelerator pumps probably junk. Oh shit, it actually works. And the power valve or valves are probably bad. But generally, you're going to want to take that carburetor off and rebuild it. You can do that now, or you can do what I like to do and go get the battery and throw it in because I like to have you know a little bit of excitement to keep me moving with the next steps instead of just working for an hour and a half and hitting the key and driving you off. That's, that's not a lot of fun. There's fun in that. Have some rewards as you go. So yeah, I'm gonna go grab the battery. All right, let's have some fun. Now, if you're lucky, the vehicle you just purchased or are reviving has a set of keys in it. If you're unlucky, it does not, but that's okay, that's an easy fix. This is all part of the knowing how systems work and then just knowing components of different vehicles. So when it comes to cranking or hot wiring a car, a Ford is stupid simple. You need about three inches of wire and you can make this sucker run. This right here is your starter solenoid. In our 79 Bronco Revival, I have a great explanation of how these work and how you can hot wire around them. For simplicity's sake, I'll go ahead and just play that clip right now. So what this does, one of these will control the solenoid from the key and engage that magnet down into the contacts and let continuity flow across from this post through to this post and out when this is energized. When this is not energized, the spring opens it up and these just sit here with nothing passing through. And this one goes to the ignition system so that the draw from the battery does not affect the ignition system as much because these ignition systems run on 9 volts. So when you have 9 volts and you take a big draw from the battery to turn the motor over, that 9 volts goes down to like 7, and it's not enough to make a spark. So this connects straight into that, and actually while it's cranking, it gives it 12 volts. So yeah, basically, these two are separate until this wire gets power, a plunger connects these two, and then these two get power. This right here goes to the starter, and this right here runs 12 volts to your coil. Because while cranking, you want 12 volts to make up for the voltage loss that the battery's gonna have from running that big ass starter. And the regular nine volt supply would not be enough to keep up with that. So that's what that wire right there does. To hot wire one of these is dumb simple. But I'll tell you right now, do not steal cars. Only do this if you're in a bind or you don't have keys for a vehicle you just purchased. All you're gonna do is pop this guy off and pop this guy off. You're gonna take two wires wrapped around here, hook one to here to turn your ignition on and tap the other here to crank. And when you want to shut it off, you just unplug that one. On this dual prong style right here, that is all it takes to make one of these run. Or you can do what these guys did and run a wire all the way to the positive side of the coil like such. Now I will say doing that will make your engine run. It will not make your alternator charge. You'll have to close a contact inside this voltage regulator, which may be in one of many spots on these trucks, to close the circuit for the alternator and make it charge. I don't exactly remember which wire it is. I want to say it might be the yellow one, but don't quote me there. 
uh, pull up a schematic of whatever style charging system you have, because they will differ. Figure out which one needs 12 volts input to close that contact, which you can hear when I do this, and you will have a charging system. So that's ignition. Chevy's, similar thing. Find that wire, close the uh, voltage regulator, and put 12 volts to this wire right here. However, on a Chevy, that solenoid is down on the starter, so you just trace the wires back, figure out which one runs that solenoid, and just clip it up here, wherever it is, and short it out into the battery post. Most of your Chevys is going to be an HEI ignition system. Those want 12 volts all the time. Fun fact, if you put an HEI system in a Ford, it needs that 12 volts. Ford's only gonna feed it nine volts, and it's not gonna run right. Run a new lead to that, or take out your ballast resistor, and get 12 volts to that ignition system. So at this point, you've got everything wired up to where you either have a key and everything's factory, or you have a wire wherever it needs to go to put power to your coil and your starter. Starting out, usually I won't even put power to the coil, I'd just do the starter for this test. That accelerator pump did work earlier, so I wouldn't be surprised if this thing pops off right now when I hit the key. But I'm gonna go in there and just tap the key and listen for any weird grinding or cracking or whatever noises might come out of this motor. And if anything's wrong, I'm gonna stop and walk up here and be like, well, what the hell was that? And stare at it for five minutes until I get an idea. So let's do that. So at this point, you know you have a motor that spins over and sounds marginally okay. I'm sure whatever that noise was, it'll go away. One of those scenarios. Everything did spin and continued over the whole time, so I'm not too worried about that. I know FEs love to bend push rods, so it's probably something goofy in there. And the weird thing is they'll bend a push rod and they'll just run forever. These things are immortal. The next step at this point is going to be disconnect your coil lead right here. Hold it up to something metal. Keep your hand away from the end of it a few inches. Keep your arm off anything metal. Try not to touch the truck at all. And kind of hover in there and hold that right there while someone cranks the vehicle. So inside the truck, our key is turned on. I'm going to take this right here and hold that near and watch for spark. And then just touch this to that post I talked about earlier and crank from up here. And as you can see, we have great spark. And what you just heard was the engine was kind of rolling over soft and then it went and it, you could hear the starter working harder. If I had a guess, that was oil pressure actually building in the motor. So that's not always a cause for concern, but if stuff starts cranking harder, sometimes you might want to stop and roll it over with a ratchet again. So we now know that this truck has spark, which is excellent. But let's say it doesn't. I'm going to pop this cap off and we're going to take a look at the points inside. Okay, well, never mind. <laughs> Someone has converted this over to electronic ignition. In most cases, there's a set of points right here, and you're gonna take a piece of sandpaper and put it between them and scrub and clean those up. Let me dig through our videos and see if I have a good example to throw in right now of us doing that and it working properly. Our points are definitely corroded though. As you can see, they're very white right there. I'm just gonna open these up and put a piece of sandpaper in there and clean them up. And you want to wipe them off when you're done or blow them off the best you can. Okay, now I'll go turn the ignition back on and if those are working, I'll be able to open it and it'll spark. So what this is doing right here is this coil is charged all the time. It has a positive lead powered all the time when it's on and it's grounded through this body of the distributor to this point. Everything on this plastic piece and up until this little brass arm right here is insulated. So right now those points are open. And what that does is it cuts the power to that coil by removing the ground. So right now that coil has no power in it. But when you close it, it recharges that coil. And because of the way these are designed, there's a long metal core in the middle with wire wrapped around. And when you remove the ground, it discharges all the power it has stored up out this wire. So whenever you remove that ground, anytime you want, it will make a spark out of that coil by deleting the ground from the system. What you can do is utilize that ability and time it with this cam right here in the center, the six lobe cam, because this is a six cylinder, that when the engine rotates, that cam rotates, see, I can just barely move it by hand. 
And when that cam opens this arm, it interrupts that ground and makes a spark. And those lobes represent all six cylinders, which is why the timing of your distributor is so important. There it went. So when your points get corroded, they will never make that connection to charge the coil in the first place. So I gotta clean those up. Ideally replace them. If you're out in the field like this, just sand them off, they'll be good to go for a little bit. All right, welcome back. I hope you learned something. Another thing to check. Clean this right here. Make sure this little tab is good. Make sure he has enough spring in him. If he's been bent down for some reason, he will not reach the contact up here. So kind of bend him up, give him a little more spring. Clean this edge the best you can. Make sure he's properly seated in there. Make sure everything moves. Now's a good time to pop off the vacuum advance line. Go ahead and suck on that and see if your vacuum advance is working. It is. So we're gonna go. That was really gross. It took a little while, but it hit me. We're gonna rotate our cap upside down and look at all those points. Then come in with a flat screwdriver or a knife and clean all of those points. And then put everything back together and try again. So we should now have spark. Our cap is back on. Pop this back off, crank it, try again, and hopefully you'll have spark. If not, you may have to replace the points. I've seen some where they're just so gone or they're, the backsides aren't uh, making any continuity and they just need replaced. But generally, a points or a condenser is all that's gonna be wrong. You can test the coil too, by the way. Let me find a clip where we show that. All right, so what we're doing right now is we're testing out our coil because apparently we don't have another one of those. So anyway, what I got going on here is I just directly hot wired the positively the coil to the battery and then we threw an auxiliary wire here under the negative side of our coil and we pulled our original coil plug off here which goes to the distributor and we put our spark plug on it and basically what we're going to do with this wire is when we um, kind of touch it to a piece of metal we're uh, basically doing what the distributor is doing and um, interrupting the coil and that discharges its spark so if you see here Got a nice clean piece that we can get a ground to. And if you look at the spark plug, the spark plug is indeed sparking. So at least as far as that goes, our coil's good. In all my years, I have never seen a bad coil. So a lot of times people just replace them to replace them. And I don't really know why. If you do, make sure you carry the old one with you because if it's made it this far, what's gonna stop it from continuing on now? Okay, quick pause. One thing I never did discuss in this video was ignition timing and installing a distributor slash making sure one is installed properly. In the part two of the midget series, which is what you're seeing right now, I do a really good walkthrough of installing a distributor and the importance of ignition timing. You can go check that out in that video. As for all of those who message me twice a week asking how to set their ignition timing, the answer is literally in your hand. You have a phone. I know this because you've messaged me. Use that and just Google it. Thunderhead289 has some excellent videos about installing distributors and ignition timing. So does Jags. So does a thousand other people. I'm getting kind of tired of people messaging me, essentially asking for me to Google stuff for them. All the answers are in your palm. With today's technology, all you have to know in life to succeed is how to properly Google a question. I literally got an ad about Googling stuff while making this. So we know we have spark. We know we have rotation in the engine. Sounds like it has compression. Nothing sounds detrimental and unhealthy inside. Let's go ahead and get something flammable down that carburetor and see if this thing will make some noise. All right, we got some gasoline. Uh, sometimes I like to use two stroke because there's a little extra oil in there. Help that top end after it's been sitting for a while, but I didn't bring any today, so. Alright. 
righty, so we have a running motor. Now we get to the fun stuff, making it a good running motor. All right, step one, the thing everyone always screws up and the thing that is usually nine times out of 10, the issue, the ignition system. Not actually the carburetor. These are pretty forgiving. A lot of people will put two or three carbs on a car and spend a ton of time working on a carburetor and it was an ignition system all along, be it the timing was set wrong, there's a bad spring inside, the points are bad, condenser's bad. I'm not shitting you, 80% of the time, it is ignition, not the carburetor. So the first FE I ever worked on taught me this one the hard way. Always, always, always verify your firing order. And I probably should have done that already prior to this, but like I said, this is supposedly a running motor in the last couple of years, so I didn't think it would be an issue. I thought it, honestly, I thought it'd run a little better. So we're gonna pull up Google. 390 FE firing order. We're gonna look at basically everything Google pulls up because it's gonna pull up whatever the hell it thinks is relevant to you. And I don't know how many times people have looked up the firing order for a 302 and Google's given the first three image as the wrong one, especially because a 302 has two firing orders. Always cross-reference whatever data it is you're working with with another source or a few sources to make sure what you're about to go through all the work to do isn't incorrect to start with. So this one's 15426378. Another way to do it is right here on the intake is stamped firing order 378. So yep, there's our firing order. Step two, find number one on the cap. Now on Fords there's literally often a little number one or a dot or a line on the cap to show you which one is supposed to be number one. If you don't have a number one on the cap, you can trace the number one plug wire. On a Ford, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, the way numbers work. Chevy likes to make you do math. They go one, three, five, seven, two, four, six, eight. We're gonna find the furthest forward spark plug. Very carefully trace that wire to right here, which is indeed where there is a little number one on the cap. So number one is in the correct position. Now we're going to look at our rotation direction. So we know where number one is. We're now gonna look at which way the distributor rotates on our phone. It's going to be going this way. So it should be one, five. So I'm gonna trace him all the way. And these, these get bundled up and I don't know how many times you'll trace it and it'll look right, but it's wrong. That's five. So one, five, four, should be the very back one. It is indeed. And eight. All right, so our firing order is confirmed. It is correct. That is not our issue with why this thing doesn't appear to be running on all cylinders. Next, we're gonna look at fueling issues. And before I take this carb off to work on it, I want to know, is it too rich or is it too lean? If it's too lean, we probably have jets that are clogged and systems need cleaned out and this will need thoroughly rebuilt. If it's too rich, it's probably a bad power valve and we can fix that right here, right now. There's a very simple way to do this, and this works for any engine. Get it running, manually add fuel. And it can be a secondary source or just pull the choke. If I put a little fuel in and it starts running better, it is too lean as it sits. If I put fuel in and it starts running worse, it's already too rich. Same thing with the choke. If it's sitting there idling or trying to run and you pull the choke halfway or all the way out and it gets better, it's too lean. If you pull the choke all the way out and it dies, it's too rich. So let's go ahead and fire this up and see what it tells us. So according to that, if you add any more fuel, it wants to die out, which means they're probably too rich, which means their power valves are probably blown. I do have a way to test it. Let me go grab a screwdriver. Now granted, it's hard to tell because of the way it's running, but to recap, the symptoms we're seeing is more fuel equals sad, and less fuel potentially equals better. And we can't really just put less fuel in. What we can do is turn our mixture screws all the way in. And remember, when you're turning in mixture screws, do not ram jam them tight. That will ruin a carburetor. Just snug them down. Like, I mean like, like an inch pound of torque until they stop turning and you just let go. So what I'm doing is shutting off all the idle circuit fuel from the mixture screws, which means we effectively have less fuel going in the engine. It shouldn't run. If it runs better right now, because there's less fuel, we absolutely definitively have a bad power valve. Let's see.
and it runs worse. Interesting. Okay, well, I'm gonna do the opposite of that. I'm gonna go out one and a half turns with these mixture screws. There's always a chance that it was too lean and me just dumping fuel in was not atomizing properly and it was just choking on it. That's too closed and it died. So, we're not getting excessive fuel into the system. This carburetor might actually be still functional. All right, so we've got some plastic line that is ran for fuel lines on this truck. I just hooked my little boat tank up. Should be good to go. There is a tank selector on this truck and I don't know where it wants to be. Uh, I'm gonna leave it where it was and unhook this to watch if we get fuel up front. So we'll just set him right there where he'll just spray fuel on the ground instead of, you know, somewhere it could start a big fire. Now this is another big thing you guys are gonna run into if your fuel pump works. Honestly, it's a 50-50. Sometimes you'll come up to a vehicle and there's already an electric fuel pump on it because the fuel pump quit years ago. A lot of times your fuel pump will work, but the lines might have a hole in somewhere. And if there's any holes in the line, it's not gonna draw fuel, it's just gonna draw air because air is lighter than fuel. In that case, pop the rubber line off the intake of the fuel pump and run it to a bucket somewhere, or like a uh, one gallon jug hanging off the bumper. And sometimes, hopefully like in this case, you'll just be good to go. So the alternator and the fuel pump work. I pulled the terminal thinking I would shut that off, but the alternator worked, so it just kept, <laughs> it just still had voltage to the coil. Either way, it's nice and flush now. I got all the shit out of the lines, which is a key component. Make sure you're always running fresh gas. Uh, you've seen us run stuff off of what's in the tank before, and I've learned that that is a big no-no with the Bronco when it started gluing all the valves and the valve guides. And now we need a new motor. Run an external tank until you have time to verify that the tank is either good and clean or you flush it out and put fresh gas in. Either way, whatever you do, always put a filter before your fuel pump so that you catch all that shit and don't pump it into your carb. So I'm gonna fire this back up and it should sit here and run on its own fuel system now. Come on. Oh, the key's off. Ford Tech Tip, what you just saw there, why did it run with the key off? That 12 volt wire I said that bypasses the ignition system and runs 12 volts right here, will have power when cranking. If your truck starts just like that, if it starts when you hit this crank position of the key, and as soon as you go back to run, it dies. In Chevys, you usually have a bad ballast resistor. Um, Fords, I don't think they actually use a legit ballast resistor. I think it's a resistor in a wire somewhere. But either way, the problem is when it's running, that 9 volt system to this coil has a problem. But the 12 volt crank system is still good. So, now that I have the key turned on, let's see if it stays running. As you can see, it's running better now, but we're still missing a cylinder. So now I need to figure out which cylinder is missing and why. And to do that, I'm going to start unplugging plug wires until I unplug one or two that don't make a difference. Let's start with number one. I'm not going to touch anything on the truck, by the way, or else I'll get shot. Number one is operating. That one does still make a difference. That one makes a big difference. That one makes a big difference. How are you? Sizable difference.
So now we know that this one right here is our culprit. He is not making any power. It makes no difference to the idle quality when I unplug him. Which one are you? Oh, and I found the problem, just like that. So when I did my visual inspection earlier, I did not visually inspect enough to find that this plug wire has been cut. So, I'm gonna get rid of him. Get a new plug wire in there and see how much better it runs. I well, didn't have as many of those wires with me as I thought, but I found one that eh, should work. Emphasis on meh, should. Alright, let's hit the key and see if it's smoother. At this point, I'm gonna pull the spark plug and inspect the ceramic portion, see if it's cracked, see if we're maybe grounded out somewhere over there, and the spark is not making it all the way into the chamber. All right, the next clue to the diagnosing our misfire adventure. I have not loosened this plug. As you can see, I can wiggle this plug. Once again, one of those weird things that I can't tell people to look out for, but now that you've seen this video, you'll probably keep an eye out for it. Plug's good. All right, time to do the old cliche and get the compression tester. All right, so let's do a quick recap. We've determined that no matter what we do with the fuel settings of the carburetor, that cylinder does not get picked back up. We've determined that no matter what we do with the ignition, that cylinder does not get picked back up. We've determined that the spark plug and the ignition system in general is not an issue because we've diagnosed all the pieces one at a time and nothing's changed. Now it is time to move on to compression and see if we have any. A normal healthy motor should be above 120. It should be like 120 to 210, especially for a stock motor like this. You start getting the aftermarket camshafts and your dynamic compression, as in what it is actually spinning over in real life versus on paper, will be lower. So I would imagine we should see all of 120 to 150 here if this is working because this is a stock motor. One thing to note when doing a compression test, you need to hold the throttle wide the heck open or else it will not properly operate. Okay, what the hell? <laughs> it didn't even move. So I'm gonna move that tester to a different plug. It is a brand new one I just picked up. Don't know if it works or not. But I'm gonna move it to a different plug and make sure everything is happy. All right, so we've got the compression tester hooked up to cylinder number five right now. I'm gonna go ahead and crank the motor over and we'll see if there's compression. To show you exactly what I was talking about with opening the throttle, I'm going to crank it until the needle stops moving and then lean in and open the throttle and you should see the needle continue on to, I don't know, probably another like 30 more PSI if I had a guess. All right, throttle open. Yeah, you can see it put on another 15 PSI, so it's not huge, but that should sometimes be the difference between a good and bad motor. This motor has a bit of wear in it, making only about 100 PSI, but yeah, she runs good enough for what we're doing. So what does this tell us? It tells us that the compression tester gauge works just fine, and that there is indeed no compression in cylinder number eight. Now, is that because there's a hole in a piston? Is that because there's a bent push rod? I don't know. I do know that FE motors are very notorious for bending push rods, so I'm gonna go ahead and pull that valve cover and we'll have some answers. The good news is everything looks fine. The bad news is everything looks fine. Let's roll it over a little bit and see if both those valves come open and close. Seem to be working just fine. This went from 
how to do a revival to what the hell's wrong with this truck real quick. All right, so we have our bore scope. And in turn, we have our results. <laughs> so as you can see, we have our piston. And it is very clean. It should be pretty greasy and grimy and dirty like this over here. But instead, everything on this side is nice and shiny, which means it's been steam cleaned. And as you can see right there on the wall, that's all coolant. That's, that's literally coolant coming out of right there. Might actually even be a cracked head. I don't even know. That might not even be a head gasket. That's a lot of fluid right there. Either way, there's our answer to why cylinder eight is dead. The best we can do for this now is just put it all back together and drive it around on seven lungs until you get a new head gasket or a head on this motor. I don't know how many times I have tried to film how to do a revival. And they, every time I do that, something weird happens and I have to either scrap that part and just do it like a regular revival or if I follow through with it, this happens if we have a bad motor. For the most part though, we completed this revival. We went through the ignition system, we went through the key system and everything else to get this thing to run and then I showed you a bunch of tips on how to diagnose misfires, which you're always gonna have on revivals. And then after that, it's just carb stuff, which we've done a thousand times. Pop this sucker off, take this bowl off, take this metering plate off, put a new power valve in, put new seals on, Put a new accelerator pump back in, put it all back together, put new gaskets underneath it, and put it all back on, and you should at that point have a finished fuel system. Tune it just like you do everything else, and then you should have yourself a run and driving vehicle. After that, it's just the usual stuff. Go through the brake system, get new tires on it, go through any bushings, grease everything, make sure there's no broken or damaged components underneath the vehicle that you can fix and you're good to go. With that being said, I'm going to go ahead and put this thing back together and we'll see if it drives around the yard at the least. All right, I have all of our sadness reassembled. Let's go ahead and hop in and hit the key because there's nothing else. Got to see if this thing still drives. One thing I never mentioned. Change your thermostat. Pretty much always bad. I think I got my firing order wrong. That's what an incorrect firing order sounds like. Doggy. <laughs> steering so that's fun but she does run and drive kind of Ooh, <laughs> no power my oh, brake light went off brakes work hell yeah well She's running and driving, but I have some definite motor work to do. At this point, I guess I'll hop on the road and take her back to the shop here in a couple days when I'm ready to work on it, throw a head gasket in it, and then decide what the hell to do with it. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, wasn't exactly what I had in mind for a how to revive your own truck, but I think we still got some good tech out there. So either way, get out there, put these things back on the road where they belong. We'll see you guys next time right here on Junkyard Digs. Make sure you subscribe to Junkyard Mook and everyone else. Peace.